Okay, so welcome to our lecture on viruses, viroids, prions, parasites, and fungi. I know it's a lot of different organisms, but you know, so much in micro up until now, we really focus on bacteria. And so I kind of want to remind you that there's a lot of other things categorized as microbes that are just as important sometimes as all of those bacteria that we talk about. So first off, looking at viruses. Now, when we talk about viruses, there's something that I'm going to keep emphasizing to you. Um, first of all, it's the fact that they are simply a nucleic acid in a protein capsid shell. So whenever I say virus, I want you to automatically think nucleic acid, such as DNA or RNA, surrounded by protein. That's all they are, two components. Okay. And when we talk about them, the other important thing to remember about viruses is that they are not self-sufficient living cells. So what that means is, if you want to qualify something as truly living, you have to ask yourself, well, what makes it alive? What makes it living, right? And we talked about that when we did genetics. We consider the central dogma what really makes a cell alive, being able to perform the central dogma all on its own. Now, when we talk about viruses, if you think of the central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein, viruses, we just said, are simply a nucleic acid and protein, right? That, that does not include any ribosomes, any, any kind of structures like that, which means that viruses cannot make their own proteins. They have to rely on a host to turn their genetic material, their nucleic acid, into something more. Into, for instance, if they have DNA as their nucleic acid, they have to rely on the host to then make the RNA and make the proteins. Okay, so viruses are not self-sufficient living cells because they cannot perform the central dogma on their own. We consider them obligate intracellular parasites because they have to, they are required to be inside of a host cell and to feed off of that host cell's resources. Now, whenever I talk about viruses, I like to refer to them as jerks because, as we said before, a virus on its own is simply nucleic acid surrounded by a protein shell. If you ever encounter a virus that beyond its protein shell has an extra membrane, for instance, an envelope around it with receptors, that's not its own. The way that it obtained that envelope is by stealing it from a former host. So what it basically did was when it released from that host cell, burst it, destroyed that host cell, it took part of the host outer membrane and it claimed it as its own. And when it then goes to other cells to infect within that host, why is it a benefit that it now has that extra membrane? Well, that's part of the host. That has the host receptors. So now the host cell is you know, figuring, oh, that's just a regular old friendly cell. And it has the receptors to match to enter other host cells. And so what it can do now is it can merge with other host cell membranes and then deposit its nucleocapsid within that host. Okay, and the nu nucleocapsid is simply the regular viral particle. Now, when we talk about viruses, of course, you think viral infection. And so you have to ask yourself, what are the stages in the viral infection of a host cell? Okay, and some of this will be familiar to you based on what we talked about with any pathogen. Now, when a virus wants to infect a host cell, the first thing it has to do is recognize that target cell and attach to it. And based on what we were saying on the previous slide, how might it attach to that host cell? Well, receptors, receptors on its outer coat that it stole, 
from previous host cells. Once it's grabbed a hold and attached to that host cell that it wants to infect, the next thing it has to do is enter, just like we talked about with any other pathogens. So the way it enters is penetration and uncoding. What that means is that it will merge with the outer membrane of the host cell and then shed its outer protein coat. So now it's just its nucleic acid within. And once it's within that host cell as just the nucleic acid, well, what do you wanna do with any nucleic acid? Replicate them and express them. So now it replicates its genome and then it expresses it through the host cell machinery to make the necessary proteins to build new viruses because viruses don't reproduce. What they do is they assemble. So when you see the word assembly, that simply means putting together the new, the new replicated nucleic acids with more protein shells. Because again, a virus is just the nucleic acid thrown into a protein shell. Once it's done that, and there are a whole bunch of new little virions or new little virus particles within the cell, the last thing that it has to do is bud out, okay, or release. And during that budding or release phase, that's when it might steal part of that host membrane, which will help it to then infect other host cells, okay, because it now has the proper receptors. Okay, so once again, the stages in the viral infection was the recognition and attachment to the host cell, penetration and uncoding, so getting inside the host cell. Once inside, it had to replicate its genome and make its proteins. And once it had that, it could assemble new viruses and then break free out of that host cell. Okay. Here I just wrote out a recap of the stages that I just spoke about, just in case you had any trouble writing down the notes for that previous slide and to answer the question that I had placed on it. So now, when we think of viruses, again, I want you to keep thinking, what does a virus need? It needs its nucleic acid, which is its genome, and it needs the outer protein coat, okay? So when we think of the genes of a virus, it basically has to achieve the ultimate goal of making more of the genome and more of the protein to then put together the new viruses. So when we talk about the genes of a virus, we have early genes, and then we have late genes. And with the early and the late genes, you have the early genes, which are for the nucleic acid replication, so making more of their genome. And then the late genes are for the protein capsid to make more of the protein so that you can have viral assembly, which again is simply putting the nucleic acid genome into a protein shell. Now, the next type of virus to, to talk about, or the next viral concept, are bacteriophages. And this shouldn't be anything new to you because you have to ask yourself, where have we talked about bacteriophages before, which are viruses that affect bacteria? Well, we talked about that in lab. That's one of the means or mechanisms of gene transfer. So we performed transformation, but we had mentioned that there's also transduction and conjugation. So when we talk about transduction, that's where bacteriophages come into play. The fact that a virus can have nucleic acid in it, so for instance, DNA in it, and it can infect a bacteria, so it can inject that nucleic acid or genes into the bacteria. And the reason why we say inject and it, the reason why bacteriophages will look like little syringes is because if you think of the bacterial anatomy that we talked about, they got that, you know, those layers around them. They have 
a cell wall, which we do not have. They have those outer membranes. So they, the bacteriophages that are going to infect them, they have to be able to really inject that nucleic acid or the genes into the bacteria. But again, the place that we've seen this before is transduction. Okay, the next thing to talk about when we, when we think of viruses is their infection cycles. So there are two terms, two types of infection cycles that a viral infection can go by. There's the lytic cycle and there's the lysogenic cycle. Okay? When you hear lytic or lysis in biology, what do you think of? You think of cells lysing, right? Bursting, breaking open. So in a lytic infection, the virus is breaking open or bursting the host cell. The reason that it's doing that is that the lytic cycle is their active cycle. They are not only replicating their genome, but they are also producing more of their protein capsid and assembling new viruses. The alternative to that is that sometimes the viruses will go into a lysogenic cycle. And what the lysogenic cycle is, is when the virus is largely dormant, okay? What that means is they're within a host cell and they've now integrated their genome into the genome of that host cell. So whenever that host cell replicates the host DNA and undergoes mitosis, they're also replicating the viral DNA. Okay, but what's not happening in the lysogenic phase, they're not producing proteins, which means they are not producing new viruses, no viral assembly. And if there's no viral assembly, if they're not producing more of that army, what's not going to happen to the host cell? The host cell won't burst open. Okay, the host cell won't even know that they have a virus replicating within them at that time. Okay, so keep in mind when you hear lytic, the virus is replicating its genome and producing proteins. Okay, there's new viral assembly. Whereas in lysogenic cycle, they're replicating the genome in step with the host cell, but they are not producing any new viruses, no proteins produce. Okay. Now, keep in mind, when we say lytic versus lysogenic, it's not two completely separate cycles. Uh, most viruses, they'll switch into one and out of it into the other. So it's not that certain viruses will only be lytic or only lysogenic, okay? They alternate within the cycles. Now, this slide here, I always tease students pretending like I'm going to make you memorize every single one of the types of viruses here. But in fact, the whole reason that I do this slide is just so that you see that there's a great variety of viruses. You know, there, there are a lot of different ways that they're categorized or classified. So what you can see on this slide is we either classify usually based on genome or based on their structural shape. Okay, so when you see classification based on genome, you'll notice that the table on this slide has, for instance, double-stranded DNA viruses or single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA. Okay, so that's classifying based on genome, whereas classifying based on structure or shape is the little figure that shows polyhedral, spherical, complex, and helical. Now, to look at some of these classifications, I have helical pictured and um, icosahedral, okay, which is more of the spherical type. And then we have complex bacterial shape. And what you'll notice about the bacterial, the complex bacterial shape, that's our good old friend, the bacterial phage. Okay? And you'll notice they need that more complex shape because what did we say in terms of infecting bacteria? They have to inject genomes. Okay? They have to be more complex because they have to break through that really tough bacterial cell wall and extra layers or membranes. Okay?
So those are just some of the shapes that we can encounter. Now we're going to go through some types of viruses based on genomic categorization. So the first category of virus based on genome that we have here is DNA, DNA viruses. Okay? These are ones that are infecting animals, and they include simian virus, herpes virus, and pox viruses. So the first one, we have simian viruses. And when you hear simian in the English language, if anyone knows what simian mean, that usually means monkey. So simian viruses cause cancer in monkeys. Then the next one, herpes virus, everybody hears that one. But the funny part about herpes viruses, yeah, I never thought I'd say the words, the funny part about herpes, but the funny part about herpes viruses is that everyone automatically thinks of the STD herpes, which yes, is an example of a herpes virus, but herpes virus is actually a big umbrella term for eight different types of viruses. And a little trick to kind of help you remember some things about these eight different types of viruses is by actually thinking of the STD herpes. So most people know that the STD herpes is you know, difficult to cure, you can't cure it, because there's latent stages. It goes dormant in the body and then reactivates later on. So when you think of the herpes viruses that are beyond that STD, the other ones do the same thing. They go latent. So herpes viruses not only include the STD type 1 and type 2 herpes, but also includes mono, so that's EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, Okay, and as you know, that's with you for life and now is associated with chronic fatigue for life. Another herpes virus is chicken pox. And chicken pox, most of you already know, stuck with for life. And what does it reactivate as later on? Shingles, okay? So when you think of herpes viruses, it's not just the STD herpes, both type one and type two, but it also includes mono, chicken pox, shingles, okay? And any of these herpes viruses, they're gonna be extra difficult because again, they go latent and then come back later on. That then brings us to the next one, pox viruses, which is funny because chicken pox is not a pox virus. Chicken pox is a herpes virus. So remember that, you may see it again. Pox viruses, what that includes is the other famous pox, smallpox, okay? And pox viruses, what you should remember with these guys is that they are the largest of the animal viruses, okay? So when you see a very large virus, that's usually a pox virus, okay? The other genomic category that we could have instead of DNA is RNA. Now, when we think of RNA viruses, the first thing to note is they have very small genomes and they have very high mutation rates, which is very troublesome if you ever wanna try and treat them. They're great at evading the host, okay? Three of the varieties that we have are double-stranded, positive single strand, and negative single strand, okay? Now, <laughs> since you all enjoyed the genetics chapter so much, especially sense and anti-sense, uh, I knew you would be so thrilled that it came back today. So when we talk about single-stranded RNA viruses, we have positive single-stranded and negative single-stranded. Notice in the figure on this, on this slide that positive is labeled as sense strand and negative is labeled as antisense strand, okay? Remember this figure is exactly how we went over transcription back in the genetic slides. Now, when you saw sense, remember we did that S sound and sense is the same as the mRNA, which then went to make proteins, right? It was the same code except with uracils instead of thymines. So now, if a virus has sense RNA as its only strand of genome, when you think of positive sense RNA, think protein, okay? 
that code is what can make protein just the way that it is at that moment. The negative strand, so negative single-stranded RNA, is matching antisense. So negative single-stranded RNA is the equivalent of saying antisense. And when we talk about antisense, remember anti meant that this code was the complement of the RNA. So we had to go one by one and do extra steps to make it into that RNA code, okay? When we did the complements, which means that that negative single-stranded RNA does not code for protein the way it is at the moment, okay? It is the opposite code. It's the complement of it, okay? So to make it a little clearer, first we have positive stranded RNA viruses, okay? Positive, think, protein, okay? That P sound, positive protein. So this viral RNA codes for protein, okay, which can make more viruses. So whenever you, add, you, you see the words, what is the significance of positive RNA, or I can call it sense RNA, the significance is that this code makes protein just the way it is right now. It matches the mRNA sequence and it makes protein. Okay, and so when I ask on the side in red, I have written, why is positive stranded virus a lucky guy? Well, because he's already got everything he needs. That positive RNA is his genome, and that positive RNA makes the protein shell. And what did we say about viruses? All they are is their genome and that protein shell. And all they want to do is make more of that genome, more of that protein shell, and boom, they have more little viruses. So now the positive guy is a lucky guy because he has the positive strand. If he makes copies of that, he's now replicated his genome. Okay, He can make protein from that and he could assemble new little viruses all from that positive sequence. That brings us to the negative stranded RNA viruses. Negative stranded, not as lucky, right? The negative stranded is not as lucky because the negative strand has more work to do, okay? Because when we think about the viruses, the goal is make more genome, and make proteins. So the negative stranded RNA, what's his problem? The negative strand, that's his genome, but it doesn't make proteins the way it is right now. He needs the positive strand, the complement, in order to make proteins. So for the negative stranded RNA viruses, they have extra work because if they have more, if they make more of their negative strand, they only have their genome. So they have to make more of that negative strand as their genome, but then they have to make the complement. They have to make positive strands to then be able to make proteins because positive makes the proteins, okay? So again, positive stranded RNA viruses have everything they need to make more genome, more protein whereas negative stranded RNA viruses do not have everything they need. They have to make more of their negative strand, but they also need to make positive strands to then be able to make protein, okay? So just keep thinking positive protein and the, just remember the ultimate goal of these viruses is to make more viruses, more genome, more protein, okay? The next type of virus is kind of one of the most famous ones. We have retroviruses, and that includes HIV. And what a retrovirus is, is a single RNA in two protein shells. So you have in the figure, the single RNA, and then one, two, protein shells around it, the yellow beads, 
And on top of that, they have an outer envelope. Now, what's important about retroviruses is they use reverse transcriptase. So you have to ask yourself, what does reverse transcriptase do? Well, reverse transcription. Figure it out, what's transcription? DNA to RNA. So what would the reverse of that be going from RNA to DNA? So we just said that these retroviruses have RNA in them. So what they do is they then inside the host use reverse transcriptase to turn that RNA code into a DNA code that then integrates into the host genome with long terminal repeats. So they use these sequences called LTRs to cut their way into the host genome sequence. So whenever that host replicates their own genome, they're now replicating the viral genome as well. Okay. Now, I also pose the question on this slide, which is what problem does reverse transcriptase cause for us? The problem is reverse transcriptase isn't very good at doing its job, okay? It's, you know, one of those enzymes that I call the undergrads of cells, not very good at doing their job. So what happens with reverse transcriptase is it does make a DNA code out of RNA. But while it's doing that, it makes a lot of mistakes. And what do we call mistakes in DNA? Mutations, right? So reverse transcriptase makes a lot of mutations and it has no proofreading ability to catch those mistakes, to fix them, which you would hear mutations and think it's a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing for the virus and a bad thing for us because the fact that it makes so many mistakes, so many mutations, means that it's constantly changing that genome, which means that if we as a host, either through our own immune system or through drugs that we develop, try to target it, it's very difficult because it's constantly changing. We'll try and target or our body will make antibodies or proteins to fight against, you know, HIV version one, but a minute later, it's had so many mutations that that's unrecognizable to us as HIV version one. So we're not able to battle that one, okay? And it's constantly changing. So the reason there are so many mutations and so difficult to target things that are retroviruses is because reverse transcriptase makes a lot of mistakes and has no proofreading ability. So now to help you visualize this idea of retroviruses and reverse transcriptase, all the way on the left here, we have normal transcription, our double-stranded DNA opening up and one strand, which is the antisense strand, serving as the template to make the RNA, right? We're all experts at this. I know that was your favorite chapter, right? So now to the right of that, we have reverse transcription. So here, reverse transcription, instead of DNA to RNA, we're going in reverse. We're starting off with an RNA, and from that, we make a complement DNA strand, okay? Just like we did when we were doing the RNA in lecture two, where you go base by base and pick the complement. So if we had a G here, this would be a C here, okay? Now, what you notice, this is two strands, but they're not both DNA strands, so that would be a problem in the host, okay? It would be recognized as an intruder and got to get rid of it. So what it has to do now is get rid of the RNA strands, and now it's down to just a single DNA strand. And what can the, D the single DNA strand do? Serve as a template to make the complement of that. So now you went from single-stranded RNA to one RNA, one DNA strand, to one DNA strand, and now it made its complement. So it's a happy double-stranded DNA. And now with that double-stranded DNA, 
it has the ability to now cut into the host chromosome. Okay, so long terminal repeats will allow it to then cut open and glue itself in to the host DNA. So now when that host replicates its DNA or expresses its DNA and makes RNA from it, well now it's also replicating and making copies of the viral genome as well. And it will make you know, the, the viral proteins eventually from that code. So now you have a nice little invader that was very efficient at what he has to do. But keep in mind that during this whole process, the reverse transcriptase will make mistakes. It does not have proofreading, so there'll be a lot of mutations and the host will not be able to, to recognize or fight that virus later on down the road. Okay. So now we have this idea of all the different types of viruses and what they can do. Now you have to ask, how do these viruses get around within the body, within the, the host that they're, they're infecting? Because we said that once they infect one host cell, they then wanna make their way and infect other host cells as well. Now, if you picture your body head to toe, right? No matter how tall you are, if you picture a little tiny microbe trying to get from, let's say, your head down to your toe, well, that's quite the distance, right? And the longer that you have for that distance to travel, the more risks you're exposed to, okay? The more risks that little virus is exposed to as he's trying to get to other host cells. So they have to have ways to kind of protect themselves in the host body. Because if you think about it, when they leave a host cell to go find another host cell to infect, that's kind of dangerous for them. Because what is your body doing at that moment? The immune system kicks in, right? You've probably recognized that there's an intruder in there. And so outside of that host cell, you have all kinds of immune cells, including things like macrophages, okay, or the various other mechanisms that we talked about to try and take down that virus, to try and destroy it, get rid of it. So the viruses had to develop ways to kind of protect themselves. How can I get to other host cells without losing myself, without getting destroyed? Okay, so there are three clever ways to help these viruses spread to other host cells without getting destroyed themselves. The first one is to go infect neighboring cells, which makes sense based on what I was just saying in terms of how big the body is. If you're a virus and you decide to go from a cell in the head to go to a cell in the toes, you have a very long way to travel. And odds are you're gonna encounter a whole bunch of immune cells and dangers along the way, okay? It's kind of like if you're commuting to, to our classes. Along that commute, you have a lot more dangers and, and problems that can occur compared to you just walking from our classroom to let's say the bathroom, okay? A much closer location. So by going from one cell in the head to a neighboring cell right next door, also in the host body's head, that reduces the risks that it's gonna encounter, okay? That's a lot safer and a lot smarter than going from a cell in the head down to a cell in the toes, okay? The next term that you see here is syncytia. And what syncytia means is that the viruses will form masses, big giant clumps of host cells by fusion. So they'll have all of the different infected neighboring cells fuse together and clump together. And then the virus will travel within the host body in this syncytia, in this giant clump of all these infected cells, okay, clumped around them as a form of protection. So now they're able to move to farther places 
without being exposed. Now it just looks like a whole bunch of host cells moving around, okay? Because they are hiding the viruses within this clump of infected cells, okay? And in some of the infections that we talk about, sometimes if you hear a granuloma, sometimes granulomas are the, um, the clinical term of having this kind of syncytia, the clump of infected cells, okay? The last term here, which is um, my personal favorite, clever way to, to have viruses spread, is decoy viruses, which is the, the picture that's on this slide. What a decoy virus or virion is, is the viruses will produce a whole bunch of empty capsids, meaning a whole bunch of empty viral protein shells. And they'll release these in large numbers. Okay, so there's no genome in there, just a whole bunch of their outer shells. Why is that a smart move? Well, the host's immune system is now going to spend all of its time and resources trying to take down all of these so-called viruses, not realizing that they're not real viruses. They're not the infection. Okay, so it allows the actual virus a better chance of navigating in the host without getting caught because the immune system is so busy trying to take care of all of these decoys, okay, which to me I think is kind of brilliant, okay? Now, for each of the um, types of infectious agents that we talk about today, I kind of wanted to give you a little clinical example. We will go over a lot more examples in the, the other lectures that we do, where you have the different types of in, the, the different types of body system infections. But to give you an idea of a viral infection, we already mentioned earlier chickenpox. And whenever you hear chickenpox, you have to be able to identify which category of virus that was. It was a herpes virus, which means that it has a DNA genome. Okay, so when you hear chickenpox, think herpes virus, think DNA genome. And what do you know about herpes viruses? Well, we said that they go latent. Okay, they go latent in the body. Particularly, they tend to go latent in the nervous system, which is why when they then reactivate, it's excruciatingly painful because they're bursting out or coming out or replicating within nerve cells. So that's why reactivation of latent infections such as chickenpox is so painful. And again, what do we call that reactivation of chickenpox down the line? That's shingles, okay? Now with any of these infections that go latent, you have to ask yourself, what might trigger the reactivation? Why now? Okay, same thing with ones such as the herpes STD, the mouth sores or genital sores, what, re what really triggers this reactivation? Well, one thing we've mentioned before is if the person is suddenly immunocompromised, okay? Because anytime you're immunocompromised, you're more likely to have infections active, okay? They take advantage of you when you're immunocompromised. The other thing that tends to trigger it is extreme stress. So think about it, if you're under a lot of stress, boom, that's when you tend to have a sore pop up or an outbreak of something because basically stress almost makes you immunocompromised, okay? The, the strain that it puts on your body and the types of hormones and everything that it releases, it takes a toll on the body. And so it makes sense that these situations can cause reactivation. Now, the other thing that I highlighted on this slide is RISE syndrome, okay, or Ray syndrome. And what that is, is a really bad complication that some people, especially children, get with chicken pox that has vomiting and even brain dysfunction. And they've found that aspirin increases the risk of that. So if you have a child or patient suffering from chicken pox, try to avoid the use of aspirin. The researchers don't fully understand the mechanism that causes it, but because you see their brain dysfunction, you don't want to mess around with that. 
Now, the good thing when it comes to chicken pox and its reactivation of shingles, you can prevent these things with vaccine. Okay, so there is vaccination for this to help prevent it. Now, just to recap one more time, remember chicken pox, think herpes virus, think DNA genome, okay? Think that it reactivates as shingles, especially in times of being immunocompromised or times of stress. So for instance, you know, that final exam coming up soon, just saying. <laughs> Now, in addition to full-blown viruses, there are two other infectious agents that I want to mention, okay? When we talked about viruses, we said a virus is nucleic acid surrounded by a protein shell, okay? Now, if you just have one or the other, just an infectious nucleic acid or just an infectious protein, that's when you get these other infectious agents. The first one is viroids. Viroids are just the infectious nucleic acid, okay? There is no protein shell around it. Now, viroids, there's not much research done on them, okay? Not much known on them because they tend to infect plants. They're not something that causes human infections at the time. And so, of course, people don't really pay attention if it's just infecting plants. We care more about the ones that infect people. I know, narcissistic, right? <laughs> One other thing I do want to mention is right here, that idea that they have small circular single-stranded RNA genomes, okay, and that they can form those little complementary structures that you see on the bottom. But again, I wouldn't ask any details about these things. Just be able to recognize that if there is just infectious nucleic acid, just RNA without a protein coat, you should know right away that's viroids. Okay, I won't ask you any details beyond def the definition there. The other infectious agent, which we know a little bit more about because it does some very damaging things to humans, is prion. So prions are the alternative, okay? Viroids were just the nucleic acid. Prions are just the infectious protein, okay? Infectious protein without any nucleic acid. And the reason why prions are so significant to us is because they're responsible for very, very severe fatal neurological diseases for which there's no cure, okay? No cure, no treatment, okay? Now, with prions, what happens is prions are actually healthy, normal neurological proteins, okay? We all have healthy, perfectly fine prions in our brain cells, but sometimes the prions can become misfolded and pathological. And what's really problematic with this misfolded form, why they're so dangerous, is that it then induces the misfolding of all the normal prions, all the normal brain cells. So you get more pathological prions, okay? Basically, my former students used to call me a prion because I'll take the healthy, normal, sweet, innocent student, and then one by one, I corrupt the whole room to be a whole bunch of mini-me's, okay? So that's basically what the prions, the pathological prions will do. If you get a pathological prion infection, it will turn all of your healthy, normal prion proteins in your brain into misfolded problematic proteins. And these um, then cause the neurological disorders, if you've ever heard of things with uh, spongiform in the name. So um, mad cow disease, the official scientific name, or Kuru, is the other one. So mad cow disease, Kuru, even CJ uh, infection. So Kruschfeld uh, Jacobson, I always mess up the pronunciation, but any of those, they're caused by prions. And my favorite clinical example is Kuru. Now, like I said, with any of these infections, whether it's mad cow, whether it's Kuru, when it's a prion, there's no cure, there's no treatment. 
if your patient happens to get uh, bovine med, med cow disease, they're going to have basically around 14 months usually is the average, and then they pass away because their brain cells, their brain ultimately becomes like a sponge with many, many holes throughout it, and they lose all proper function. Now, as sad as all of this is, my favorite example of prion infections is Kuru. And what happened in terms of Kuru, there was this tribe, I believe it was in New Guinea, around the 50s and 60s. And this was the first time we discovered infectious prion diseases and the neurological infections that you could get. Um, the reason that Kuru came about, this prion infection, was in this tribe okay, in New Guinea, what the family members did is when a loved one died, they would then go with, you know, traditional cannibalism, which sounds horrifying to us, but in their religious sense, it made sense to them. You know, you lose a loved one, you want a part of them to always be with you. So the women were then put in charge of preparing the loved one's remains and feeding the various parts of that loved one to the rest of the tribe. Now, what's interesting is when this was going on, the women and the children were becoming dangerously ill and dying, okay? They'd go through the clinical stages that I'd have there, and it ends up leading to complete brain dysfunction. And when you see things like cerebellar ataxia and athetoid uh, mo movements, these are things where you lose motor abilities. You, you lose even vocalization. You lose your extremities, able to be able to move and everything. And what's really interesting is that as scientists and the medical community, we realize that the reason it was the women and children is in, you know, typical traditional society, what do they give men versus women and children? Well, the men, they think virile, big, strong men. Let's give them the muscles of the deceased loved one. Okay, so they were eating muscles, whereas the women and children were eating the other remains, which was the brain, okay, brain and nervous tissue. And so since this is a neurological disorder, it was the brain that was infected. So the women and children were coming down with this horrible, debilitating, fatal neurological disease, whereas the men were not. So Kuru, thanks to this form of cannibalism and, and infection, helped us to see that people can get infections that are neurological and that we have to be very careful in terms of any of these prion infections because there's no cure, no treatment. Ultimately, the brain becomes like a sponge full of holes and the person loses all motor abilities, verbalization, everything until they pass away. So it's a very sad story, but also very fascinating with regard to um, the cannibalism aspect of it and how you know, something as simple as giving the men the muscles versus giving the women and children the brain, that's how you're able to narrow down what was actually causing this infection. Okay, so that's it in terms of viruses. The next types of infectious agents that I wanna go through are parasites, not the undergrad type, and fungi, okay? Parasites and fungi. So first up, par first up, we have parasites, okay? When we talk about parasites, we have two main groups, protozoans and helminths, okay? And when you're trying to kind of define these, usually I have students remember helminths first, okay? Whenever you see the word helminth, that's a worm. So if you picture a worm, that's macroscopic. That's something big, multicellular that you can really see. So for helminths, write down macroscopic multicellular worms. That then guides your mind into remembering the next one, protozoans, which are the opposite. They are microscopic, single-celled, okay? 
microscopic and single celled. So the difference between these two, protozoans are microscopic, single celled eukaryotes, whereas helminths are macroscopic, multicellular worms. Now, either way, you have to ask yourself, what do parasites do? Well, they infect a host and they harm the host to benefit themselves. Okay, so they harm the host to benefit themselves. Now, going into those two categories, going into protozoa and then going into helminths. First up, we have protozoa. Now, when we talk about parasitic protozoa, they're categorized based on their motility. And what does motility mean? How they get around, how they move around on their own. So the first of these categories of protozoa is flagellates. So what does that sound like? What does it have in that word? Flagella, okay? So flagellates are simply protozoa that are motile by having flagella. The next category are amoeboids. And amoeboids, they're motile by having pseudopods. Pseudopods, P-S-E-U-D-O-P-O-D-S. -E and what pseudopods are, or in that picture of them, they're little extensions, okay? They're little bulges of cytoplasm that are fake feet, basically. Okay, that's what pseudopods means, fake feet. The next one are spor sporozoans. So sporozoans, they're only motile in the gamete stage, okay? So gamete, again, we've mentioned this word before, that means sex cell. So in their sex cell stage, they're motile, they're able to get around as spores, okay? And then the last one is ciliates. And again, each of these, a lot of these are easy to kind of picture how they're categorized because ciliates, they have the word cilia in them. And that's exactly what they use for motility, cilia, which are these short hair-like extensions that we've mentioned before. Okay, so all of the little fluffy hair-like extensions around the ciliates in the figure, that allows them to propel forward. Okay, next up, since we talked about protozoa, next up we have helminths. And again, as soon as I say helminths, think worms. And I absolutely love helminths. You know, some girls love diamonds. I love DNA and worms. So when we talk about worms or helminths, there are three classes. There are the nematodes, the cestodes, and the trematodes, okay? Nematodes, these include round worms. Okay, usually going into your gut or your digestive tract and they stick with their host for life. And they can even end up being multiple hosts, in multiple hosts, okay? But we're not gonna go into the details of, of that right now. Then you have cestodes, and these are the ones everyone knows with tapeworms, okay? Tapeworms, those long ribbon-like worms that also like to go into the digestive tract. So a lot of times worms you'll see in digestive tracts. And these tapeworms, they have suckers and hooks. And you have to ask yourself, well, why would that pathogen want hooks or suckers? And if you think back to the five things that pathogens need to be able to do, one of them is attachment, okay? So suckers and hooks are for attachment. These guys also contain proglottids, and I want you to circle, star, highlight the word proglottids, okay, because that's important in how a lot of us get infected by worms. What proglottids are, are segments of the worm that have the complete male and female reproductive system, okay, and they'll be able to self-fertilize because they're hermaphroditic, and those little sections, those proglottids, are able to separate from the rest of the worm. So you can then accidentally ingest some of these proglottids that have self-fertilized, and boom, you now have a bunch of little worms in your digestive tract, okay? The next one are the trematodes. Trematodes, also known as flukes, 
And the way I kind of remember these guys is they are leaf shaped and look at the name, trematodes, think tree, tree with all of those little leaves on them. Now, these guys have two suckers on them. The first one is for oral and or you know ingesting and for waste so excreting and this is what we call a blind track so thankfully we as humans do not have a blind track we have one hole that's for ingestion and one hole that's for waste but these worms do everything from one individual hole and then the other sucker is for attachment because again for things to be parasitic for them to be pathogenic, they need to be able to attach to the host and really stay in, okay? So now, thinking in terms of these different types of parasites, you have to ask, once they're inside the host, what do we know about their life cycles? Okay, well, before we get to that, how are they getting inside of these hosts, right? What is their exposure and entry? So now, with parasites, they're usually exogenous. And when you hear exo, what does that mean? Exo is from outside, right? As opposed to endogenous, from within, okay? So things like bacterial infections can be either exogenous or endogenous because we have a lot of normal flora inside our body that likes to become opportunistic pathogens. When it comes to parasites such as worms, we do not have any worms naturally in our body. Okay, the only way that you will get a worm parasite is exogenous from the outside. And when we say how do they usually enter, one of the most common ways of entry is ingestion. Ingestion or through parenteral root, which are cuts or, or you know, accessing uh, the skin at the bottom of your feet, for instance. We'll talk about that in a few slides. But the funny part is, is when we talk about entry of parasites and we say ingestion is the most common way, I don't want you to picture ingesting a bunch of worms, okay? No one, you know, bites into a sandwich and they see the worms and, you know, eat them. What you're actually ingesting is what I mentioned before. You're usually ingesting fertilized eggs or, you know, the, the larval stage that you can't see, okay? So for instance, those proglotted segments, you're ingesting a little sack full of fertilized eggs that are microscopic to you. They're, you're not going to see them, okay? And then once they're inside, they continue their life cycle and they become adult worms, okay? Now, what's interesting is a lot of these worms will not replicate once they're in your body, okay? So they'll go through their life cycle of growing up, but they won't be reproducing within your body. But then you say, well, how do you get massive uh, amounts of worms, such as the picture on this slide, which is a real picture, a whole lot of worms coming out of that digestive tract well, because that proglotted, that little sack full of fertilized eggs that you can ingest, there can be a huge, huge amount within there, okay? Sometimes it's up to 200,000 fertilized eggs that you are ingesting at once, okay? So keep that in mind in terms of entry of these parasites. It's exogenous and a lot of times you're ingesting them in contaminated food or water. And we'll talk about the details in a minute. So going through a few examples of the, um, the parasites, particularly helminths, because like I said, helminths are some of my, my personal favorites, okay? When we look at helminth infections, the first kind that we like to talk about are roundworms. Now, this is an example of a soil transmitted parasitic worm, okay? There are three, three main soil transmitted parasitic worms. There are roundworms, hookworms, and whipworms, and I'll show you each of them in a minute, okay? So three soil transmitted parasitic worms are roundworms, hookworms, and whipworms. These are especially problematic where human feces is used as fertilizer, okay? 
they, they call that night soil or where there's accidental contamination of human feces, okay? So whenever I say that, that human feces leads to a lot of the worm uh, infections in people, don't think of, you know, someone pooping outdoors and you're, you're just ingesting that. You don't realize that you're ingesting something that was contaminated. So, for instance, crops or, or food products can be contaminated by poor sewage or septic errors. Now, thankfully, this isn't as common in America where we have such strong, you know, regulations on everything, but it's very common around the world. Okay, There's over one billion people infected with these helminths or these worms every year. Okay, so when you think of the roundworms, what's interesting is that sometimes they can show no symptoms at all. Whereas other times they can be very problematic if you ingested one of the large amounts of them. So for instance, a sack filled with a ton of these you know, um, fertilized eggs, well now they can have tough, flexible little body parts that perforate or break through your intestine and give you peritonitis. Or if you notice from the slide, they're known for migrating. Okay, which means that they like to make their way to places that you would not expect. They can migrate to the lungs and cause pneumonitis, or you can get this tangled bolus structure in your digestive tract in your colon area and need to have it surgically removed. And this poor little boy um, in the picture on the left, that shows the migration of these worms. They can even make it to your head, to your eyes, okay? So it's very terrifying, these kinds of infections. And again, a lot of it is based on contamination of fertilizer or food products through feces, okay? The next example that I have here are hookworms, okay? Hookworms, which can since they are soil transmitted, they can be um, contained through, you know, contaminated food and whatnot, but these are actually more commonly uh, obtained through walking barefoot, interestingly enough, walking barefoot places that have been contaminated with animal feces that contain the eggs of these worms. So for instance, if you're walking barefoot on the beach, so these pictures on this slide, real infection, a couple got a nasty hookworm infection from walking barefoot on a beach on their honeymoon. I forgot if it was Punta Cana or it was somewhere either in Mexico or Dominican Republic, uh, where walking barefoot on the beach looks perfectly normal. Everyone's doing it, even flip-flops that are open and exposed. You're walking through that sand, not realizing that you can be on the fanciest of resorts, closed in beach and everything. Stray animals get around, okay? Stray cats, especially in places like this, or even birds coming down. You can't control all of the animal poop. They can clean the beaches, make them look nice and pretty, but you can't see the contamination of animal poop and worm eggs that are there. So walking barefoot on beaches or even in your own yards or soils and in sandboxes. So kids especially tend to get hookworm infections from sandboxes. You know, you're at the playground and there's a sandbox outdoors you're at that moment only seeing the children playing in it because it's daytime hours. But how many times do stray animals kind of wander along? Think of cats when you have cats. What do they like to go to the bathroom in? Kitty litter box is basically like a sandbox, right? So it makes sense that they will walk along there, do their business, and then you won't see it, but there'll be the contaminated worm eggs in there, okay? And so the problem with these guys with hookworms is they make their, these little tunnels throughout your skin. So they, they usually enter through the barefoot um, bottom of your foot or top if let's say you're wearing flip flops and made your way through the sand. And through the foot, they make these little tunnels 
but they're not able to properly survive within humans. So they're meant to be in dogs or cats or animals, uh, other animals. So they're not able to survive. So they'll make these tunnels in their lowest life form, like their larval stage, making all these tunnels under your skin and all. You'll then get an allergic reaction from it and they'll die within there. So they're dead under your skin because they can't progress to their later forms. They can't become adults, okay? But you get these nasty tunnels that blister, that bubble up, that, you know, kind of eat away at your skin because you have such a bad allergic reaction to, to them being under your skin, okay? The last one to mention are whipworms named because as you can see in the picture they look like little whips and a lot of times the way you'll see diagnosis with whipworms is you'll see like in that picture either an endoscopy or a colonoscopy gets a good view you see them lining that gi tract okay um, like we said this is one of the three main soil transmitted worm infections and so the way that someone gets these is through there being poor sanitation or human feces fertilizer just like we said before so again no pooping outside um, but with poor sanitation and human feces you get this contamination on especially crop products so fruits veggies things like that or you might even get your hands or fingers contaminated with dirt let's say in your own yard or something like that, and then put your fingers in your mouth without realizing it. So for instance, oh, you know, I was just messing around in the dirt, but I needed a snack. So, you know, grab an apple, grab whatever you're eating, and you get this contamination in your mouth, you ingest it, okay? And then the person will end up with abdominal pain, bloating, bloody diarrhea, weight loss, all of that, because they ingested these um, fertilized eggs, okay? So again, keep in mind when you hear roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, contaminated soil. It's all about that soil. Be very careful of dirt and soil. Now, going back to the general idea of parasites, now that we've had those beautiful examples, um, we have the parasitic life cycle in the host. Okay, there are two terms that I want you to remember from this slide, and that's intermediate hosts and definitive hosts. So with parasitic life cycles, the example that I usually explain this with is with plasmodium protozoa, and that's what causes malaria. Okay, and the trick to remembering what its definitive host is versus what its in intermediate host is, think of the phrase definitely sex. They're definitely having sex. So the definitive host is the host in which that parasite will be sexually reproducing in, okay? Whereas an intermediate host is the host in which that parasite will only undergo asexual reproduction, okay? Asexual reproduction, not sexual reproduction. So in our example with plasmodium, what causes malaria, okay? Plasmodium will be sexually reproducing in mosquitoes, not in humans, okay? So the mosquito and the human will have the plasmodium infection, malaria, but the plasmodium is sexually reproducing in the mosquito. So what does that make the mosquito? The definitive host. It's not reproducing in humans, okay? It's sex cycle only begins in mosquitoes when it ingests blood from the humans, okay? Since it's not sexually reproducing in humans, what does that make humans? We're only the intermediate host of plasmodium when, when a human has malaria, okay? So intermediate versus definitive host. In the intermediate host, the parasite is only asexually reproducing, no sexual reproduction. Whereas in the definitive host, they are sexually reproducing. Okay, now the last category to talk about are fungal infections. Okay, when we talk about fungal infection, most fungi are commensalist relationships. Okay, what that means is 
usually when you, you see fungi around, they are basically one, one member of that relationship is harmed, whereas the other one is unaffected. Okay, um, and so with commensalis, commensalism, sorry, uh, one, one is benefiting and the other one is unaffected, okay, as opposed to parasitism where one is getting harmed at the benefit of the other, okay? So normal circumstances, fungi are not really doing anything to what they're feeding off of, okay? Now, they are opportunistic pathogens. And that's a term that we've discussed a lot before. And with opportunistic pathogens, again, normally the fungi we said are not causing harm, but under the right conditions, they might jump to be a pathogen. Okay, They might end up being problematic. Now, what's important to remember with fungal infections is that fungi do have cell walls Okay, which means that you can target them selectively because humans do not have cell walls. But when it comes to fungal cell walls and their membranes, they're much stronger than bacteria. So fungal infection is going to be a little more difficult to treat than bacteria, but a heck of a lot easier to treat than some of the other infections like viral infections. Okay? Now, fungal infections or fungi are heterotrophic. So that's a term that we've mentioned before. That's when an organism breaks down organic material to obtain carbon, okay? As opposed to the ones breaking down inorganics for carbon, which would be autotrophs. And the last thing that I have mentioned here is their reproduction. So you'll see asexual or sexual reproduction with fungi, but whether they're using conidia or spores, basically in the figures you can see um, conidia look very similar in terms of spore, but they won't have an extra enclosed sac around them. Now, something from lab that we've mentioned a bunch of times and even the lecture before, which means that you will see this again, is the difference between yeast and mold. Because yeast and mold are both categorized as fungi, but what are some of the dis differences? Well, that y sound unicellular yeast versus multicellular mold, okay? And the other thing is how they grow. So remember when you did the hand prints, whenever you see mold, it's gonna be that fluffy, flower-like outward growth. Whereas here in those bottom pictures, you can see yeast cells, they're instead growing very smooth, shiny, small colonies, okay? So yeast versus mold, you have unicellular versus multicellular, and you also have the difference in how they grow. So yeast is smooth, shiny, small colonies, whereas mold is fluffy and flower-like. Okay, so what you see, let's say, growing on uh, when you say moldy bread, for instance. The other thing I wanna mention in terms of fungal infections is the word mycosis. So whenever you're in the hospitals working uh, in terms of medical care, whenever you see mycosis, that simply means that there is a fungal infection present. And there are four different categories for this. The first one is superficial mycosis. So with superficial, think of anything superficial is just cares about the outside alone, right? So superficial mycosis will be fungal infections on non-living outer skin, the hair, or the nails, okay? So superficial is non-living outer skin, hair, or nails infection, okay? Then the next type of mycosis that your patient may have is subcutaneous, and subcutaneous means under the skin, right? So it's localized in subcutaneous tissues right under the skin, and those will cause non-lethal cysts. So you'll see a cyst form, but they're non-lethal. You then have mucocutaneous mycosis, so mucocutaneous mucus, right? This will be fungal infections of eyes, ears, sinuses, your oral pharynx, or even the very common vaginal fungal infections, okay? So that's mucocutaneous. 
And then, of course, the worst of them all would be deep mycoses. So deep mycoses is usually only in immunocompromised people. It's caused by inhalation, ingestion, or even things like contaminated surgical needles. And because, like the name suggests, it's deep, this will go deep tissue, organs, or even move through the blood or the lymph. So the deep mycoses is when it could be very problematic for a patient. Okay, so you have superficial, subcutaneous, mucocutaneous, or deep mycoses. Now, the big problem in terms of fungal infections is that they can produce mycotoxins. So there are more than 100 toxigenic fungi and more than 300 mycotoxins. And when it comes to mycotoxins, unlike bacterial toxins, mycotoxins, there's really only supportive care right now, okay, and trying to remove exposure to mold. They don't have um, really uh, good antitoxins for the fungal toxins released. Now, when we talk about mycotoxins, when we talk about mycotoxins, the big one I want you to remember is aflatoxins. Okay, there's a whole bunch of different categories, but I'm only going to go over two, aflatoxins and ergot. So aflatoxins, what I want you to know about this one is that the aflatoxin B1 is the most potent natural carcinogen known. Okay, so most potent natural cancer causing thing known is aflatoxin from fungi. So when it comes to aflatoxins, okay, a lot of times uh, they're produced by aspergillus and you'll see it a lot on crops like corn or peanuts, things like that. Um, it's usually through ingesting them, but if you're picturing these crops, how can you also end up with aerosols? Well, getting those crops, right? You have this huge machinery that's pulling and breaking down and, and moving around all of these crops that can release the fungal spores into the air and in addition, release the toxin, okay? Now with the aflatoxin, not only is it the most potent natural carcinogen known, but it can cause two different types of problems. It can cause acute aflatoxicosis or chronic aflatoxitosis, okay? Acute, when you hear acute versus chronic, chronic is lifelong, right? So chronic would be something like getting cancer from the toxin and getting immunosuppression. Whereas acute, acute comes on quickly, right? So acute would be when this causes death. And the way that this toxin can cause death is it can cause acute hepatitis, okay? So very quick infection that leads to death, okay? But the big thing that I want you to remember, aflatoxin, aflatoxin B is, B1 is the most potent natural carcinogen known. The other mycotoxin that I want you to remember is ergot. And this is one of my favorite things in microbiology because of what it caused in history. So ergot, you see, is produced by Claviceps purpurea. And the lysergic acid structure is common to all of these ergot alkaloids. Now, where do we usually hear lysergic acid? That's LSD was discovered from that. So LSD, the very hallucinogenic drug, very popular in the 70s especially, is actually a derivative of fungal toxin, of mycotoxin ergot. Now what's interesting about this is this ergot, this, this fungal infection and toxin, tends to be in grains. And so way back in history, rye grains, got contaminated because it was a very warm, damp, rainy season. And so the rye got this fungus on it and the people who ate it during this season ended up getting this mycotoxin, this toxin. And since it's kind of, you know, it's related to LSD, 
a, a hallucinogenic drug, if you think about what it does when you have this convulsive kind of restriction of, of blood vessels and everything, these, especially the children who are more, you know, prone to really seeing symptoms from something like this, ended up having these convulsions, spasms, vomiting, delusions. And you even, because it's neurological, you get these crawling skin sensations, which are very, very um, creepy and scary. And it's affecting the central nervous system. And as you see in that diagram in the, in the picture on the, on the slide, you get these weird contortions and, and convulsions. And this is what caused the Salem witch trials. So they ate this contaminated rye and suddenly when you see the children having these convulsions and everything, they blame witchcraft, okay? They were seeing hallucinations. They were thinking that there were witches. They were thinking that their skin was crawling and that there were these, you know, horrible tremors and convulsions and all. It was actually a fungal infection. So a big part of our historic creation of witches and, and belief in witchcraft came from fungal contamination. And the next year in Salem, or if you if you looked at the, the weather and everything, it was a very dry season the following year. And that's why there was no longer any problem because the, the fungal contaminations tend to occur moisture and heat of a summer. If it's a dry summer, you don't get as much microbial growth. Okay, so it's very fascinating that mycotoxin, something as simple as a fungal infection, when you don't know science yet and you don't know research yet, that's where development of stories like witchcraft can come from because you want to find some way to explain the unexplained. And unfortunately, they didn't have the science at the time to really explain it. And so a lot of uh, women, unfortunately, were killed because of it. Now, the last point that I want to make in terms of fungi is you can actually catch fungal infections from other people. So specifically yeast infections. Everyone hears yeast infections and they associate it only with women. Okay, because yeast infections are very common for women, whether you're sexually active or not. So when it comes to yeast infections, all women have candida albicans as part of their normal flora in the vagina. But if you think about this location that the fungi is growing and thriving, you know, yes, it's normal flora, but sometimes it can get over overdeveloped, over overgrowth growth especially if you think of if the women are wearing too tight clothing okay tight um, panties or or very tight pants and there's excess heat warmth especially summer months wearing excess tight clothing for a long time not changing down there enough um, also including things like during their their periods not changing pads and everything as much, you can very easily get overgrowth of this yeast, even hormonally. So for instance, some women every month right after their menstrual cycle, they may get a very slight overgrowth of candida albicans, minor uh, yeast infection. And the more overgrowth that there is, there's more intense irritation, there could be discharge, there can be swelling in the region, and there can be dysuria. And when you hear dysuria, that simply means pain when urinating, okay? Now, thankfully, there are antifungal topicals, so usually things like clotrimazole or fluconazole, um, topical treatments for this since it's such a common infection. But what I do want to point out, because most people, especially young people, are not aware that during sexual intercourse, male partners can catch yeast infections. So for males, it's called balanitis when they've caught a yeast infection from their partner. And what balanitis means is inflammation or infection at the tip of the penis. And so the male now will experience discharge, pain, itching, 
burning, you know, dysuria as well, because he now caught a yeast infection. So please keep in mind that yeast infections are not just for women, as most people tend to think that they are. Um, males can catch yeast infections as well, okay? That is it for today's lecture. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to contact me in the Remind app day or night. Thank you and have a wonderful day.